Season 1, Episode 6, Tailing Ponds, Planet 9, Lima Beans and Potatoes. Mind Earth Criteria Number 4, Geological Evidence. There is evidence to suggest that Lake Umayo of Sulistani, as well as many other lagoons and lakes in the Andean Mountains of Peru, could be the remnants of ancient gold mine tailing ponds. So back to the Chupas de Sulistani archaeological complex, just off the shores of Lake Titicaca in the Puno district of Peru. Lake Umayo. Lake Umayo itself is unusual in that it is very deep in one end and very shallow in the other. This could easily be explained if we agree that the lake is the remnants of ancient mining. Tailing ponds in known mining operations today are designed exactly like this. One side of the tailing pond will be built up deeper water with a distinct edge on the water whereas the other end will be shallower with a gradual blending edge. Deep defined built up edge, shallow gradual blurry edge. At the deeper edge of the lake, we see what look like to be artificial mounds where we got a clear distinct edge on the water. We also see a secondary mound which is a tailing pond feature to catch seepage. Primary dam, secondary dam. Primary dam, secondary dam. And at the other end of the lake, we see a more of a gradual blending landscape where we see these constructed or engineered raised fields that we argued were designed to be flooded on a seasonal basis. Of further interest, a recent study conducted by Carolina Spravinga of Torino, Italy, not only confirmed that these raised fields caused seasonal flooding, but remarkably discovered that they also formed geoglyphs. These geoglyphs are yet to be explained. However, they fit in nicely with the mind earth premise. There are literally thousands of glacier ponds and lakes up in these altiplano regions of Peru and Bolivia. And perhaps it'd be worthwhile to take a look at a few of these and compare them to other known tailing ponds as yet another piece of speculative evidence supporting our premise that this area has been mined in the past. So let's look at a few actual tailing ponds for comparison. So here's a mine, Sierra Corona up in Northern Peru. And we'll see there's sort of a built up end here and a more shallow dissipating end here. So let's compare this to a lagoon, another lagoon in the area that is not a mine. And what we see are some of the same color characteristics and some of the same physical characteristics. For example, a defined deeper edge with shallower dissipating evaporating edges as well we see sort of the built up side of the pond uh, with these terraces these built stone walls these constructed walls of small stone that tend to be or seem to be in this in this whole upper region of Peru and so some of these features are very similar to what we're going to see around known mine sites and known tailing ponds. Katawi Tin Mine. This isn't surprising. This is what tailing ponds are supposed to look like. They'll have a well-defined edge on one end and some more of evaporated dissipating end on the other. What is surprising is the number of lakes in this area that actually look like tailing mines that aren't supposed to be tailing mines. Like this lagoon just north of Lake Titicaca again has the deeper defined edge surrounded by built up terraces and walls and a lower dissipating shallow edge similar to what tailing mines look like. 
There are geological processes which can seemingly account for the formation of these lakes, such as glaciation. However, the fact that these the edges seem to be built and that they look so similar to other known tailing ponds in this area can't, in my opinion, be ignored. This is just one more area that we look forward to investigating in Mind Earth. Mind Earth Criteria number 11, a source for cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen. Hydrogen cyanide is the precursor to the chemical sodium cyanide. Sodium cyanide has been found to be invaluable in the mining of gold. And without it, gold mining as it operates today could not exist. No hydrogen cyanide, no gold. It's that important. However, it wasn't until 1752 that French chemist Pierre Maguire demonstrated that the coloring pigment Prussian blue could be converted to an iron oxide and hydrogen cyanide. That means that hydrogen cyanide or what used to be called Prusik acid, was first isolated from the coloring pigment Prussian blue, the same Prussian blue that was used in Vincent van Gogh's painting Starry Night only 250 years ago. However, since its formal discovery in 1752, it has been determined that hydrogen cyanide is a naturally occurring substance. It is found in and produced by mammals, it is a major component of the atmosphere on Saturn's moon Titan, and it has been proposed to have played a part in the origin of life here on Earth. These are all of interest and may have further connections to mind Earth investigations. However, of more direct relevance to our current mind Earth investigation is that since its historically documented discovery in 1752, hydrogen cyanide has also been documented as being naturally produced by plants as well. As many as 3,000 plant species produce hydrogen cyanide, and incredibly, many of these plants are major present day, as well as having been major ancient, staple, population sustaining food crops. Is it possible that the chemical hydrogen cyanide was known about well before Pierre Maguire's Prussian blue discovery? Pierre Maguire isolates hydrogen cyanide for the first time, AD 1752. Lima beans containing hydrogen cyanide cultivated for the first time, 8000 BC. And if it was known, could there have been purposeful manipulation to increase levels of cyanide in plants, including many of our staple food choices? There are over 3,800 different varieties of potatoes that have been grown in Peru. Could this cyanide have then been grown in our food, harvested, extracted, and used to mine gold? Cascading circular stone cyanide gold leaching tanks. As remarkable a proposal as this seems, there is evidence to show exactly that and ancient ruins of cascading circular stone cliff dwellings? That doesn't add up. Mind Earth criteria number 11, a source of cyanide. It is a Mind Earth hypothesis that many of our ancient food sources, in this case lima beans, cassava, and potatoes, were deliberately and possibly genetically manipulated to both feed the human population as well as to produce cyanide. Cyanide that was then used to mine and extract gold from hard rock ore. Gold that would eventually be taken off earth to fix and maintain a damaged atmosphere on the Anunnaki home planet of Nibiru. Well known and well documented that lima beans, cassava and potatoes 
all originated in South America. All three have been, and many still are, considered sacred and have been embedded within myth and ceremony for thousands of years. Lima beans were once a sacred, elite-only delicacy among the Moche civilization of North Peru. But it was always the gods that received the best of the harvest throughout history, in the form of offerings and tributes from the worshippers of ancient cultures. A Moche stirrup vessel decorated with lima beans. Could it have been the cyanide pressed from the lima beans that was kept in these vessels? A moche stirrup spout bottle with a series of beans displaying different patterns. The state of preservation and the quality lead us to believe that the object was intended for offering purposes and not for domestic use. The observation, plausible as it seems, requires more comprehensive evidence in order to be confirmed or otherwise falsified. Perfect for cyanide offerings to the gods. Cassava on its own, also known as manioc and yucca, is a staple for about 700 million people worldwide. This perennial plant is native to South America but thrives in almost all tropical climates. Cassava, like the lima beans and potato, is very resilient, surviving where many other crops fail. And through experimentation, thousands of varieties of these plants have been developed to grow in almost any local microclimate. But these versatile, resilient crops have one significant downside. Raw, unprocessed lima beans, cassava, and potatoes are sources of cyanide. The ability to produce cyanide is the key to understanding the history of these foods. These are foods that are important because all three contain cyanogenic glycosides. These are the chemical precursors to cyanide. The most common explanation for the presence of these chemicals is that they evolved as a mechanism for plant defense. The cyanogenic glycosides impart a bitter taste that seem to put off any casual grazer once it has taken its first bite. But the plant also has more extraordinary backup plans that is thought to stop more determined herbivores. The cyanogenic glycosides can be rapidly processed by enzymes within the plant to release lethal hydrogen cyanide. The enzymes and glycosides are separated within the plant cell, but if the tissue is damaged, for example by a bite, the two mix and rapidly release the toxic compound. A cyanide bomb. Enzymes within the human gut can also liberate hydrogen cyanide from the cyanogenic glycosides if ingested. Hydrogen cyanide disrupts the fundamental process of respiration within cells. Without energy, cells die rapidly and on a massive scale, leading to loss of life. Symptoms of cyanide poisoning include vomiting, nausea, headaches, and convulsions. Treatment is possible, but it must begin quickly before irreversible damage is done. It is not a substance you would want to ingest. Other than cassava, lima beans, and potatoes, there are about 3,000 other foods that produce cyanide. Of extreme interest to our story is that researchers have found that these cyanide producing foods occur in about 11% of our cultivated plants, but only in 5% of plants overall. What does this mean? It means that plants with cyanide in them have been deliberately chosen to be food crops. It seems extraordinary that such potentially lethal plants have been deliberately chosen and bred to become some of the most important crops in human development. It is hypothesized by the most that the ability to resist pests outweighs the potential deathly danger within. However, when put to the test, studies have confusedly unveiled that these pest resilient qualities are highly overestimated and the cyanide does not work in this capacity at all. Here are some examples of the natural defense theory not working. But with no other explanation for the presence of cyanide, the prevailing unsubstantiated reasoning persists. Why would humans want food with cyanide in them? Dealing with cyanide is a dangerous business. Even ingesting a small amount of these foods without first treating them can get you very sick or even kill you. It turns out it is very difficult to find a biological explanation as to why humans would have cultivated food 
like lima beans, cassava, and potatoes, with such high concentrations of cyanide. Genetic cyanide levels in cassava tubers vary widely from 75 to 350 parts per million, but can be up to 1,000 parts per million, or 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. This is indicated by the bitterness of the tuber. Some varieties of lima beans, especially those found and grown in the highlands of Peru, have remarkably high levels of up to 3,000 milligrams of cyanide for every kilo harvested. If added to water, the cyanide from one single kilogram of lima beans would be sufficient to produce 10 gallons of cyanide leaching solution with a high enough saturation level to leach gold from gold ore. One kilo lima beans, 10 gallons gold mining solution. To most, there seems to be no obvious reasons to cultivate food with cyanide in them. Mind Earth, however, would suggest otherwise. Could it be that lima beans, cassava, potatoes, and other cyanide producing foods have been cultivated purposefully in order to produce cyanide to be used by the genetically modified human slave race to extract gold from mined ore all over our planet to be then taken to repair and maintain the atmosphere of Nibiru, the home planet of the Anunnaki. The idea does not seem so far out of reach anymore. Everything that Planet Nine does to our solar system is, is done by gravity. So it's the gravitational influence of Planet Nine that we are basically reading. Here what we see in purple, these are the huge orbits of the distant Kuiper Belt objects. They all kind of lie in the same plane. They're all arranged into the same overall directions. So that something is gravitationally shepherding them. This object is Planet Nine. Standing up and saying, we think there's a ninth planet is a pretty dramatic thing to say. And if we were gonna say that, we didn't wanna be wrong. Uh, in fact, since the time even of Percival Lowell and even earlier, people have been talking about new planets and new planets and new planets, and they're always wrong. For 150 years, if you stood up and said, I think there's a new planet, you were wrong. Planet Nine, and the most sort of surprising thing, it tilts the entire solar system by about six degrees with respect to the sun. Planet Nine could very naturally explain that. Yet another population of distant bodies that Planet Nine predicts is objects called centaurs that orbit out of the plane of the solar system. They're perpendicular to the planetary orbits. The fact that these objects have been observed, and they really are there, is one of the strongest lines of evidence we have towards the true existence of Planet Nine itself. There is now an, a, a laundry list of things that Planet Nine does that we see. It is inconceivable to me that there is not a Planet Nine out there. There are just too many things that were previously unexplained that Planet Nine naturally explains. The astronomical confirmation of the existence of Planet Nine would be the first real expansion of the Sun's planetary album in 170 years. It would completely redefine our scale of what the solar system really looks like. It seems like there's other planets out there. Could Planet Nine be the Anunnaki home planet of Nibiru? Let's get back to the lima beam for now. Yet another remarkable case in point. A recent scientific study conducted by researchers at the J. Craig Venter Institute in Rockville, Maryland, has now found that humans have more DNA in common with lima beans than we do with chimpanzees. 
This led researcher Marilyn Rolovo to be quoted as saying, there are a multiple number of possible implications, but the most likely being that we have absolutely no idea what's going on around here anymore. We have reached out to Marilyn Rolovo for thoughts and feedback on our mind earth research on this matter, with no response yet to date. Could it be that ancient native versions of these cyanide producing foods were found and genetically modified using the same techniques used to genetically modify the ancient native ape creatures into humans? Could they have been manipulated and introduced by the Anunnaki with the dual purpose of feeding a population of gold mining slaves while simultaneously producing the chemicals required to do so? The potato is another food worth looking into in more detail. Although not well known, the potato was first domesticated in the region of modern day southern Peru and northwestern Bolivia between 8000 and 5000 BC. It has since spread around the world and become a staple crop in many countries. Potatoes generally have lower cyanide levels. However, the cyanide levels in potatoes can be increased by an almost unfathomable 300 times by exposing potatoes to cold temperatures and sunlight. Being a nightshade similar to tomatoes, the vegetative and fruiting parts of the potato contain a toxin called solanine. Normal potato tubers that have been grown and stored properly produce cyanide in amounts small enough to be negligible to human health. But if the green sections of the plant, namely the sprouts and skin, are exposed to light, the tuber can accumulate a high enough concentration of cyanide to affect human health. Of great interest to our story, the native people of the Peruvian highlands still grow and preserve their potatoes by making chuño. The ancient and sacred process for creating chuño is to freeze the potatoes at night and dehydrate them during the day by exposing them to direct sunlight. Scientists and nutritionists tell us that these are the exact things we should purposely avoid when dealing with potatoes, as exposure to sunlight can increase the levels of the cyanogenic in ingredients in potato skins by an amazing factor of up to 300 times the original amount. And the freezing weakens the cell membranes that prevent these components from mixing and creating the lethal compound of hydrogen cyanide in the first place. Chunyo is made during June and July, during which time the temperature reaches around negative 5 degrees Celsius at elevations of over 3,800 meters. After harvest, the potatoes are selected for the production of chunyo, typically small ones for the ease of processing. These potatoes are carried up the mountain and are spread closely on flat ground and allowed to freeze within the low night temperatures and dehydrate in the daytime sun. By the end of this process, usually around May, the potatoes are taken to Chuño China Pampas, flat areas where the potatoes can be laid out. Once they make it to the Chuño China Pampas, they are trampled by foot. This eliminates what little liquid is left still remaining in the potato and removes the skin, enabling subsequent freezing and drying. They remain as they are for over a week, depending on the weather conditions. During the process of manually extracting the liquid out of the potatoes via an extremely rigorous, intense physical process of stepping on them, whole families end up participating. The previous nights of freeze drying has broken down cell walls, making it easier to remove the liquid from the potatoes. They build a small pile of potatoes with their feet and then dance on the piles, removing the skins as they do so. This will not entirely remove the skin, so the remaining is removed by hands afterwards. This method of freeze-drying potatoes for storing food for later consumption is effective, if done properly. But it is a very difficult, laborious process involving a procedure that mirrors, in the most exaggerated way, exactly what we are taught not to do when dealing with potatoes. We are explicitly taught to avoid freezing and exposing potatoes to light 
and these will lead to increased production of cyanide. Exposure to light also causes the potato to turn green through other chemical processes within it. The doses of cyanide in green potatoes can be lethal if not processed correctly, and in general it is recommended that green potatoes should not be eaten at all. The chunyo process goes well beyond the greening of potatoes and leaves them exposed in the direct rays of the high altitude sun until they are blackened. This particular process, along with evidence to suggest deliberately breeding and selection of potatoes that have abnormally high cyanide levels, has baffled many an expert in these fields, but it all makes perfect sense and fits as yet another essential piece in Mind Earth puzzles. These findings, as incredible as they may seem, are much more than coincidences. As we will discover, almost every other potential ancient gold mining site around the planet has an ancient food, usually considered sacred to the local peoples, that has abnormally high levels of cyanide in them. The Middle East, specifically the area around Jerusalem and the Jordan Valley, has olives, China and India have bamboo and rice. South Africa also has cassava, and the North American potential ancient mining sites had maize, all of which had similar chemical properties and characteristics. Mind Earth Criteria Number 11 A Source of Cyanide it is a mind earth hypothesis that many of our ancient food sources, in this case lima beans, cassava and potatoes, were deliberately and possibly genetically manipulated to both feed the human population as well as to produce cyanide. Cyanide that was then used to mine and extract gold from hard rock ore. Gold that would eventually be taken off earth to fix and maintain a damaged atmosphere on the Anunnaki home planet of Nibiru.